And in fact, for drugs that were approved in both places, 64% of the time they were approved first in the US before in Europe, and 86% of the time they were approved in the US before Canada. So the myth that somehow FDA is slowing things down is not borne out by the facts. <clears throat> The reason we don't have as many new drugs as all of us on the stage and in the audience would like to have is because the pharmaceutical industry is not bringing a lot of new drugs to FDA to approve. And they can't approve a drug that is not submitted to them. And yet they, they have this tension because they need to be able to have a drug brought to them. And yet they know and we know that manufacturers' enthusiasm, to put it as kindly as we can, about a product that they're trying to market is perhaps not always going to catch all the downsides. And we've all seen examples of that. So there needs to be an agency that represents the best interests of the American public and it can say to the manufacturer, that does sound promising, but there are some things that you really need to look at. And if it's an important new drug, we'll get you an answer in six months. I don't think that's too much to expect a, of a company to do, especially since we know that any drug that is powerful enough to make a difference in patients' lives is also powerful enough to do something that we don't want it to do and didn't expect it to do. And one cannot know that because of enthusiasm or because of medical need. There does need to be a cautious agency out there looking at drugs. And Dr. Challoner later will talk about devices, which is the other piece of FDA's responsibility besides food, which we're not going to get into. Um, and we, we need to have something interposed between an enthusiastic company, which has billions of dollars riding on, it, on the success of its product, and the public health of the American people. And there needs to be a rigorous review. That rigorous review can be done quickly, it can, and it is being done quickly. It is generally favorable, and just because we can make it better by informing it with genetic and other kinds of biological discoveries doesn't mean that we don't still need to have a traffic cop, kind of like an air traffic controller. We all saw a couple of weeks ago what happens when we have big government back away from having enough air traffic controllers. The FDA is the air traffic controller for our drugs, and that is why we need their caution. It is not the case that it's causing public health problems. In fact, they have gotten faster and faster over the past decade, and as a result, they are proving that they can help the American people be protected from drugs that have bad effects. And that's exactly what we need them to do. And that's why I think that it is important to vote against the proposition that FDA's caution is, is hazardous to our health. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry Avorn. <laughs> and a reminder of what's going on, we are halfway through the opening round of this Intelligence Squared US debate. I'm John Donvan. We have four debaters, two teams of two, fighting it out over this motion. The FDA's caution is hazardous to our health. You've heard the first two opening statements and now on to the third, debating for this motion that the FDA's caution is hazardous to our health. I want to introduce Peter Huber, a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and author of the forthcoming book, The Cure in Code, How 20th Century Law is Undermining 20th Century Medicine. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Huber. Well, in case you didn't know, uh, our side actually won the first round of this debate in, 19, no, in 1992 uh, when we persuaded the FDA to adopt uh, what is called the accelerated approval rule. Uh, now, I must confess that the rule has been applied um, um, not very widely, but in two particular areas and not with wholehearted enthusiasm, especially of late. But I intend to persuade you that this rule is, in fact, the only place at the FDA today where we are actually making use of the very best uh, modern pharmacological science that we have. It is, in fact, the, uh, the, the protocols that the FDA uses much more often, the unaccelerated approval, if you will, uh, where we are actively obstructing uh, uh, the use of those technologies. And it is, therefore, in the standard protocols that the FDA has been using for a very long time that it, the FDA is actually hazardous to your health. Um, uh, let me begin by giving you some brief context uh, and a description of where this rule has been applied. Um, uh, go back to 1988, a couple of biochemists from the United States and one British uh, win a Nobel Prize for their um, uh, mastery of what is called uh, structure-based design. And this is the, the one, of, one of the two processes that they've been using ever since to design precisely targeted drugs that can hone in on a molecule that is associated with some uh, disease. Um, uh, 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 this is some years after HIV arrived in town, and they quickly develop uh, several drugs that can uh, uh, target different parts of HIV's uh, chemistry, um, which until very close to that time had been completely un uncurable. The FDA licenses these drugs at absolutely record speed, applying its uh, accelerated approval uh, rule, and it soon becomes apparent 
that not one of them is going to be any good, not for long, not on its own, because the virus mutates so fast that you throw any single drug at it, and it very quickly uh, develops a resistance to it. You just can't beat it with one drug. Drug, But doctors at this point, because the drug's been licensed, uh, are now free to work things out on their own, and they very quickly begin assembling these drugs in cocktails, and that does the trick. Um, the, other, the second area where the rule has actually been applied quite aggressively for the last uh, 20 years is oncology. Um, and uh, it's, uh, here is a, a brief picture of the kind of medicine that has emerged in, in that area. Uh, there are at least 10 biochemically distinct breast cancers out there. It's not one disease. We treat some of them with uh, estrogen blockers. We treat others with estrogen itself. Okay. One of the estrogen blockers performs well only if you have the right liver. It, depend it has to be metabolized by your liver. You know, some patients have the right liver, others don't. There are at least two other major receptors and two classes of drugs in breast cancers, and you mix them all up in various ways to try and uh, beat the disease in the individual patient. We're finding civil, similar levels of complexity and diversity in almost all of the major intractable diseases we're facing now, the neurological, the autoimmune diseases, and indeed in many very common diseases like diabetes. They just aren't going to be beaten with one-size-fits-all drugs. The underlying chemistry isn't going to allow it, um, which is is bad news for the FDA uh, because the FDA's standard protocols are actually pretty good at getting a licensing one-size-fits-all drug, but they are worse than useless, it turns out, when they encounter complexity. Uh, using accelerated approval, the FDA can, in fact, handle complexity uh, reasonably well, and it's going to do it even better. Uh, in your book, uh, Dr. Avorn, I surmise you do not like this rule at all. You attribute its uh, origins to AIDS activists who terrified a the agency with a massive sit-in. Uh, here's another view. The rule has allowed for the development of pioneering and life-saving HIV and cancer drugs over the past two decades. That quote from President Obama's Council of Scientific Advisors in a report issued uh, last September. And the report recommends that the FDA use accelerated approval much more systematically and broadly for all drugs that are address an unmet need uh, in treating a serious illness. Um, notice, um, this is why we have one lawyer for every three doctors, notice that the report did not endorse accelerated approval uh, because it got drugs to patients sooner. It said that the rule allowed for the development of those pioneering drugs, but for the rule we probably wouldn't have many of those drugs at all which means that the benefits of that rule have absolutely dwarfed anything that our opponents here can possibly tell you about the rare side effects that might have been missed when that rule was applied. HIV has killed an average of, of about 20,000 Americans a year in the 30 years since it surfaced in the United States. The numbers would have been horrendously worse if for the last 20 years uh, we didn't have uh, some good treatments for the disease in, in place. Uh, we owe 40 cancer drugs and 50 new treatments uh, to accelerated approval. They have given years of additional life to uh, many patients. There is no story about safety and side effects that can possibly approach those numbers. Um, so this magic rule doesn't just get us the drugs we need licensed faster, it gets them licensed, licensed when the, other, the FDA's other rules, the slow rules, just won't license them at all. How? In brief, it, what it does is it loosens the FDA's grip on uh, the throttling grip on the process just enough to let doctors get involved and work out the really good drug science uh, using the very best to, uh, to tools available. I want to briefly take the time to tell you how this is working because, you know, it's not really that complicated and you can make your own judgments about whether it makes sense. First of all, ordinarily the FDA won't license a drug until it sees clinical symptoms. Accelerated approval will let you license a drug based on, say, its ability to lower HIV. IV loads in the patient's blood. And by the way, if it works in only one in 10 patients, the FDA can still license it. It'll make an ad hoc call. Gee, that looks promising. We want it, okay? Under accelerated approval, uh, therefore, the drug gets licensed much, much sooner, but it also gets licensed on much, a very different kind of evidence. The White House report makes clear that this is exactly what we should doing. We should start with the premise that when we have a new drug, it may well be only one piece of a solution that's giving only partial benefits to a minority of patients involved in the, who you've just you sort of enlisted in, in the drug trial. Uh, the FDA standard protocols allow nothing of the sort. Under the current application of the rule, the FDA again in a very ad hoc way says the drug company, says to the drug company implicitly and doctors explicitly, look, work out the stuff, the rest, you know, once you, you got the drug out there, as they did with HIV. Uh, the, White, the White House report would systematize it. You know, you would gather torrents of information during the trials 
and you would, and you would uh, use those to work out how, uh, 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 molecular information, you'd use those to work out how the patients are doing and why some are, are faring well on the drug and, and others aren't. That kind of screening of patients and active uh, rearranging uh, the trial as it progresses is anathema under the standard FDA protocols. You're not allowed to do it a at all. Um, the, the, when you do it, you actually get to precision molecular medicine. You work out how a drug can be precisely prescribed to patients and used just right. The FDA is frozen in the headlights. It can't deal with these torrents. It has no experience with them. You need big computers to do it. It is hazardous to your health because it can't use the science. Thank you. Thank you, Peter <laughs> Hubert.